Hey everyone, welcome to Punkcast. My name is William Maxwell. I'm a student of Web3 and the owner of Punk9527. CryptoPunks are 10,000 uniquely generated characters stored permanently on the Ethereum blockchain. No punk is the same. This is a show dedicated to celebrating the punks behind the punk. My hope for this podcast is that we capture the essence of the punk culture, elevate the brand and the individual behind the punk. One last thing, projects discussed in the show is not financial advice. Crypto and NFTs are a volatile and risky asset class. Please always do your own research. Other than that, let's go. Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Punkcast. Today we're back with another awesome interview with an awesome punk. Punk 7298 with three Addies, Bandana, Rosy Cheeks and Regular Shades. He's a rare Asia-based punk and a great friend of mine that previously was based here in Hong Kong and recently relocated to Singapore in the new year. In real life, he's a senior investment banker in Asia, a Punk Ventures member, and a big time collector of things from sports cards to kicks to art and NFTs. Please welcome the charismatic DJ and Mr. Art Karun to the show. Art, how are you, man? Hey, how's it going? Good, good. Doing well. Doing well. And th- thanks for having me on. Long time no see. Yeah, long time no see. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited to sort of unpack this, man. Yeah, I know. Excited to be to be on finally. <laughs> we've we've had opportunities to sort of catch up, just maybe from some context as well. Th- this is probably one of the beautiful things about being in the punk community, right? We originally met at a punk meetup sometime back last year at that pizza place on the on the balcony, if you remember. That's right. And it was just a whole r- bunch of random DJs and punks that were turning up. And basically you were sort of sitting quiet there in the corner and didn't get a chance to sort of speak to you. But towards the end, I was just like, going, holy shit, man, this guy's done so much stuff. So uh, it's really interesting, all the things that he's been doing. It'd be great to sort of share that with everybody, man. So welcome. Maybe um, we could just start with a little bit around your handle, Art Karun. Because I think people are probably wondering if this is your real handle or your real name. Well, Art is my real name. Karun is, is part of my real name. So there is a, a clear linkage to me. And I think that's, that's okay. Generally, I, I say what I think. I, I'm pretty open uh, about things. And, I, and I, that's how we met at uh, that time. I actually enjoy meeting a lot of the other DGENs uh, around. And, and again, but that particular meetup happened to be free. One of our other good friends, another punk uh, member in Hong Kong, just randomly reached out to me and said, hey, uh, are you free today? I think it was that same day. <laughs> To come down for drinks, uh, and then that's when I got to to come and met you guys, uh, met you, Daft Punk, all the you know the other guys in Hong Kong, the usual troublemakers. Yeah, that was fun. No, that's cool. And uh, look, I know parts of your story, but uh, it'd be good, really good to go in a little bit more detail and unpack everything, man. So, like, who is Art Karun? Where did you grow up? What's your sort of background, and how did you sort of get into sort of Web three? As I said, my name's Art. Uh, I've been in Asia for a, a long time, but I've moved around quite a bit. Uh, as you also mentioned, I'm a, a senior uh, investment banker, and that's the only career that I've been doing now, 23, 24 years, uh, and all of it uh, across Asia. Uh, but really, for, for a lot of things that I can remember, particularly around you know, collecting hobbies, things like that, for, it came about when I actually moved to the U.S. for a period of time in the early 80s. So I moved in the U.S. I was there for about uh, nine years, grew up there uh, from grade one. Um, and, and, and really, during that time in the 80s, you can start to see sports becoming a lot of, you know, quite popular already. When you're a young kid, you probably start looking at those guys in football and basketball and start to you know, appreciate some of the things that these sports are quite amazing and quite fun to watch. And, and that's kind of how it kind of opened the doors for me to start looking at collectibles in that space. And this is a, at an early age uh, when I started to dabble into collectibles and started with baseball cards. And it, it really started from randomly walking in the candy aisle at a shopper supermarket and say, what are these little things, you know? But hey, these are pretty cool dudes on a card. <laughs> <laughs> so I started to, to, to dabble into that and really became quite addicted to get more. And as a little kid, you start to, you know, save up, you have a little bit of allowance, Go to Seven Eleven, start picking up these packs. These packs have gu- bubble gum in them. You know, you open them and they randomly have random uh, athletes on them. I mean, and 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 for the most part, I start to know who people are. Um, and then and then the, the the great thing about that, once you start doing that, then you start having little meetups and trade cards. And I can remember a stack of cards and you know, held together with rubber band at the time. Or then we became a little more sophisticated. So that that's how that, that's really the beginning. And and you know uh, from there. 
you know, it, it, it evolved to, to much, much more for time. And, and really, it, it really kicked off in terms of becoming much, much more active when I had a real job <laughs> and, and I had real uh, money to start uh, buying things and more money. You start to, you know, think back of the, the things that you, you know, want before. And, and, and that's how I started to end up collecting or building a, a pretty, pretty sizable uh, sports cards collectible collection 20 years ago. Yeah, oh, man, that's huge. So many things to sort of unpack, man. And I uh, sort of relate to that as well, just growing up and collecting basketball cards. I do remember the rubber bands. That probably wasn't the best way to keep your cards in good condition, right? No, nah. <laughs> nah, that's right. Did you have a um, a favorite sport that you would prefer collecting over others? Because I sort of see in your current collection, you've, you collect multiple cross sports. Yeah. Back in the days, it was baseball. I collected that. Try to build stats. Try to you know, collect certain teams. I remember certain players. But then it evolved, really, it became football. And, and, and you know, for, from a young kid, my passion around sports also played into this, right? So I, I, I played football when I was in high school. Pretty, pretty decent. I mean, I, I, I won most valuable player for my county. Um, oh, wow. And it was undefeated uh, county champs at the time. I mean, again, it's, it's youth league in the U.S. This was in Northern Virginia. I mean, decent, decent, pretty good. I mean, I would say decent, pretty good uh, football state. You know, my high school, I was there for about a year and played uh, freshman football. I made varsity at the end of the year. And then uh, I had to move back to, to Thailand. I'm originally from Thailand. I don't know if I mentioned that. but and, and so football had to be put away. And then I moved into basketball. So there was this kind of transition. Basketball was, was also, also there. I mean, I played basketball. I wasn't really any good at it. My younger brother was really good. Grew up playing basketball. But when I moved to high school, I mean, the, it just, I had the skill set. I had the energy. Physical trait was decent. So... So I started playing basketball and I really didn't enjoy and love playing basketball. And that led also me to, to then after high school, go to the University of Kentucky. And, and, and thus, you know, the linkages around like being the color blue, for example, uh, with the University of Kentucky strong in basketball uh, tradition. And I was there during the late 90s when uh, we won the national championship title for two and three, two times in three years. In 96 and 98 and we lost to arizona in 97 so again a big run during those well i was there for five years but three of the five years I was there we were able to do very well and again revalidated my interest and passion into basketball uh even though i did play high school basketball as captain and play point guard oh wow but but then being in college was great man do you, you uh you do it all mate jeez <laughs> one, one more point actually during the time i was in kentucky I was in the dorms, you know, like I was, you know, came from Thailand, international student. I mean, I mean, I grew up in the States, so it wasn't really uh, international, but I was in this dorm and my resident advisor for one year was this guy called Frank Vogel, who is now the new coach of the Phoenix Suns. Um, so at that time, he was just a RA who was trying to walk on, tra- transfer to Kentucky for I think my captain. Try to walk on, and the great thing about that when we were in the same dorm, we played basketball together. In the mirror, present with uh, uh, the Kentucky Wildcats. Oh, crazy! Uh, that's a nice little side story. Mate, just just going back a little bit. So you said you moved to you, you're from originally from Thailand, and you moved across to the states. What what was why did you move? Like, did your whole family move for work or something? Or yeah, yeah, my my, my father was a diplomat, so um, that was a reason why the whole family had to move. I had one younger brother. So. Oh man, what a cool life. And, and so you, okay, and then you, you were collecting all the way through, played sports, relatively good at sports, had an appreciation for it, got into the University of Kentucky. What, what were you studying there? Like, uh, what was your sort of majors? <laughs> My major, well, I, I, I studied finance. I mean, I like when I was young, okay, another side note, uh, in addition to collecting all these sports cards and stuff and garbage trail kids in 1985, 86, during, uh, away from that was also, I was pretty good and, you know, looking at the newspaper every day and trying to understand stocks and, you know, what those uh, quotes meant, uh, what symbols uh, meant. Um, and so I had an interest in, and I was just, you know, since I was there in Kentucky, then I just studied that as an undergrad. And the great thing about that time, it was also the beginning of the internet, if you recall. I mean, I, I remember I was in the computer labs uh, using ICQ at the time. That's the chat, um, the chat um, <laughs> app, right? The not app, but the, yeah. the software. Um, yeah, I was using Max. And what was your What was your handle back then? Uh, I couldn't remember actually. I it probably linked back to my <laughs> my university email or something like that, and, and, and I couldn't remember what that was. You know, something like AK something. You know, okay, those, so, uh, so not 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 so embarrassing then. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It was a basic university kind of email. Yeah, nice. And because of that, during the beginning of the internet, I mean, that's kind of where I also learned how to trade stock. Right? Stuff popped up uh, during the late 90s. And, and then you start you know, trading stock and you can do that in the computer labs, <laughs> which is very cool. <laughs> yeah. So, oh man, okay. So in terms of, we'll get, we'll get back into finance in a moment, but I just wanted to backtrack a little bit. How did you find the transition from, you know, being a kid in Thailand, Asia-based, culturally moving over to the US? Yeah, no, I, I was too young, right? I was like six. So at that time, you were just kindergarten and moving to first grade. So it was still relatively young and, and I couldn't really, and I didn't speak any English when I moved there. So it was one of those, it was too early for like, and I don't know who, you know, the, based on the audience here, right? I mean, it was too early for like ESL, right? English as a second language and special <laughs> classes. So you just get thrown into a, the the regular classes and, you know, know very little way to communicate. Um, so the the great thing about the U.S. at the time is a lot of cartoons, right? So I watched you know, Transformers and He-Man and even Garfield, Chipmunks, all those, you know, cartoons, which at the end of the day helped me learn English, <laughs> which is, which is quite funny to think about it, but and then developing and, and learning culturally, it was it was a, it was a bit different. But but again, as I say, I was young. My parents were there, so they kept uh, they instilled still the more traditional Thai culture uh, within the household. So so things maintained. There's a level of balance between the two inside the house, outside the house. Yeah, nice. Ah, oh, good. And then okay, so then you got into finance, uh, and it sounded like you just had a natural knack for stocks and dabbling with stocks in the in the early days. What next? Uh, you, you sort of went straight into you know career in banking, like yeah, yeah, and no, I uh, I, I did. I, I mean that it, it really started briefly in Hong Kong in, in the late nineties, and if you recall, you know this is right after the Asia financial crisis in nineteen ninety seven when there was a lot of chaos in the region, but with chaos comes a lot of opportunity. That's really where things start to open up. You know, people with profiles similar like mine had some opportunity. We we were educated from the West. We did learn a lot of the skill sets from the West. We communicated well in English. We communicated well locally in the region. Uh, we were culturally sensitive. So it was a natural kind of like, okay, well, this guy ticks the box. Let's bring him out here and then start working on deals. And and I work in the investment banking division, which is, you know, your general corporate finance, your help companies. At the time, you know, post the late 90s was, you know, debt restructuring, quasi m a then later on end up to be more you know fundraising on the uh, for me on the equity side so helping companies become, go public in the capital markets i enjoy that and i moved around a lot i mean within the same bank hong kong a few years uh, thailand a few years uh, back to hong kong a few years tokyo a few years you know, back to hong kong again then singapore and kept on moving around I mean, across the region which for me made it quite exciting and and gave me an opportunity to see a lot of Different cultures, different people learn a lot of new things. You know, even in Japan uh, at the time, I was in the mid 2000s. That was right after LeBron came into the NBA, and sports cars were pretty big. Actually, basketball cars were very big, and and that's when again, again, I re dabbled into, you know, buying all these cases of uh, basketball cards uh, that upper deck release around the LeBron uh, years. And well, he came in 2003, but in the mid 2000s, were you buying? Um box packs and you know ripping packs open or you buy into the singles that's right that's right so it was a, a i mean i i do i mean again it, it shifts over time i mean that, that's the beauty a beautiful part of collecting is that it, it, it is a hobby right and collecting you can do it many ways if you're trying to collect sets players you, you know probably try to buy packs in, in in boxes or or you know again boxes come in cases right so where there may be 20 boxes in a case and you buy that and you spend you know, sometimes the day you can rip it all, you can open the packs and check out your cards, uh, or you can, you know, spend over t- a bit of time to do that. And I still, and I still really enjoy it all. And then the taste of trying to find that special rare card that you wanted, or, you know, it's something that, that it was said to, to be hard to get. And, you know, again, at times it wasn't about the price, you know, so it's not, I, I mean, I had you know, extra income, so it was more like the enjoyment of ripping the packs and getting the cards or chasing to find certain cards that you wanted. You didn't really mind paying the price. I mean, prices back then weren't as expensive as they are now, but um, it, was the, it was the thrill of it. Uh, that's how I, I felt. Entertainment. 
Yeah, absolutely. It's it's almost like a, a dopamine hit yes. every single time, every time you, you open it. <laughs> you just get that hit, and it, it's uh, yeah, it's super nice. And I, I sort of find it in some ways is strangely relaxing as well. Once you ripped open the packs, you're like sorting through your cards, putting them in number order, and putting them away. In terms of your collecting style, what do you sort of go for? Do you go for, you know, full sets? Do you go for rares? Like, um, how do you sort of collect? I, I realized early on, so this is still even the time I was in the U.S., um, before college, so in middle school, I, I, I realized early on, man, you can't keep on buying packs or, or boxes and, and uh, ripping them up and then getting cards because you're go overwhelm you overwhelm yourself with so much so many cards and and then storing them and then so I, I realized that sometimes going for steps is very difficult and and such you know I started to then pinpoint around specific players at the time right teams and players and then even then teams very difficult and players in, in the 80s 90s there weren't that many cards of each individual player so you can start chasing players that made more sense and then later on when 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 we progress further uh, you know kind of more to the where we are today, you know, getting cards of players that you really like, the superstar, it became too expensive and you can't, you know, get every card. So then you start pinpointing, which one do I want? Which ones make sense for me to hold, right? And, and it's a progression. So you start getting a rare, let's say a rare Michael Jordan card um, and you want to get the next one, but you're going to have to save up. You have to make sure that you have enough money for, and, or you can trade up use your old card to trade up but you're trying to get the, the rare one the hard to find the one that uh when you hold you you really enjoy that that's the transition from being a kid and opening a lot a lot of packs have a lot a lot of cards have boxes and boxes of cards and uh, and transitioning to now still a lot of cards but uh, a lot more selected a lot more curated uh to what i like and and every time you know i i, I look at them i remember each one how i got them how i how I wanted to chase it, how I uh, like them. Yeah, nice. Um, so, so like right now, what's your, I guess, your top three favorite cards in your collection? Oh, okay. Top three. I mean, I have a lot of a lot of favorites. I mean, the 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 long time favorite since I was like I was a kid actually was when Garbage Girl Kids released their uh, cars back in 1985. It was in the third grade at the time. Um, so I have a, an interest in that. And the car that I was always chasing is Adam Ball. So that's the guy that you and I should have brought the cards to, to show you, but but that's the when you know little kid that um, and this is a satiric kind of it's a satire of the Cabbage Patch Kids, and he had this little kid with the head blown up, you know, with the with the atom bomb with the <laughs> like atomic bomb blowing up in his head. So that that's a beautiful card. I mean, and, and and I have artwork around made from around that card. And I have a lot of those cards. I have, you know, I find a card. Not it's too expensive to just keep on buying it, but yeah, at the time I find cards, I just buy it. Grade some buy or some grade it. Is that a rare piece? It's it's rare and in a very high condition. So again, not not to dig too deep into grading, but if it's graded at PSA ten, it could be quite expensive. But most of them is hard to get good like that great grading condition. So that's why a, a PSA ten is rare, and, and thus it's you know you can say artificial rarity. I mean, I wouldn't say art, even though they produce maybe a million of these cards. Maybe only a, a couple of hundred are in a certain condition that people chase, and you want the best condition because. It's, it's like an art piece, right? You want to get the, the best, uh, something in good condition. And then the other two cars are just more, more modern day. One is a special uh, golf car that I have, uh, Triple Auto, uh, which I like a lot. And then another Tom Brady car that I like a lot. Ah, oh, nice. Yeah, I think I saw the Tom Brady on your, um, on your Instagram, which is pretty cool. Yes, yes. Um, yes. Just, just out of curiosity, how much is that a, a PSA 10 you know, Garbage Pal Kids worth? The Adam Bomb one. I, I don't know. I mean, I think now it's probably in the somewhere. I think somewhere in the around in the tens of thousands, ten thousands. Wow, think that, that's I, I crazy. Mean, it went up a lot during the, of course, the big boom in twenty twenty one. But but that's why I couldn't buy it that much at that time, right? I have, I have quite a few of those. You know, say ten, but but I I, um, I try to accumulate. These are some things I won't really sell. No reason to sell. Uh, yeah. At some point in time, if I need the cash, maybe I have to, to do it. But if I don't need the cash, then it's just get stored in in a safe somewhere storage so besides cards what else do you collect i, I see some memorabilia sort of sitting in the background of your uh your uh oh, your video I, have a lot. I have a in the back here is a is a, a case of um storage of 
uh, not just cars, but it has, this is like a temperature control storage, right? So it has graded video games, it has nine graded video games, it has... What, what, what do you mean video games? Like, like um, I don't know, in, uh, I'll, I'll bring it to the show. Like the video games would be like the actual Nintendo cartridge graded in a, by a grading company, similar to, to like a uh, sport cards, you know? And, then, and, and, and these are also collectibles. I mean, my, my favorite game, of course, again, growing up in the 80s, liking football was Tecmo Bowl. So I have a, this one is a Tecmo Bowl um, graded by Wata. Oh, uh, no way. The it's original in, one. It's like in a proper case in and case. everything. Yeah, that's correct. So similar to, you know, card, right? And, and PSA, a, a company that grades, um, I think also acquired Wata. So I have a lot of these. I mean, I have a lot of these things I collect. I have to collect watches. I mean, a lot of Patek. I mean, but watches I, I like to wear, but I, I have a, you can't see here, it's a huge spinning watch winder with a lot of watches on it. But I also collect watches. I collect before coins. I collect a lot of things. I mean, you can almost say everything I, I have <laughs> is a lot of collection. What does your wife think of all this? Hoarder. She thinks I'm a hoarder. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I even collect stupid things like boxes of stuff. I mean, I don't even throw before a uh, box like certain things i don't throw boxes away right because i think the box actually has is very cool the box has the deck uh, the 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 image of the stuff the um i mean i mean i just collect a lot of things i keep a lot of things and i have storages i mean i, I rent out storages you know temperature control right so you can that's insane from across the world <laughs> all right so, so uh, i mean like i think you're probably one of the biggest collectors that i know i don't think i've met anybody that's collected as much stuff as you actually I, even when you were leaving hong kong i think you were um moving boxes of um shoes as well so you also collect shoes <laughs> which you got yeah I, I collect sneakers and but i had to sell i decided to sell quite a bit because sneakers take up too much space and you know in hong kong singapore you're you're limited space right rental as most people will realize and if you look at the news it's the most expensive rental market in the world right the number one number two um, so you run out of space very quickly and, and I realized shoes, they can't, it's, I mean, I, I'm actually, I kept some that I like, uh, but you know, nowadays I just want to wear it I mean, at the stage where even if it's a very expensive pair of sneakers, I don't mind wearing it. It's something that I, I, I enjoy doing. Uh, so I, I wouldn't say I collect as much anymore of that. Right? Just, uh, I use it now. Yeah. What, so why do you collect? Do you think like, why do you think you collect so much stuff? Well, it's a, uh, it's, it's fun. It's kind of like that feeling again that you're a kid when you have stuff that you can, I mean, it's, it's kind of a weird feeling, right? It's when you have stuff that you, you've been able to acquire or find or trade or in some capacity buy and you have it in front of you that you own it and that's yours. It's fun. You know, it's like, it's pretty cool. I mean, and, and that, that's an element of, of it. I mean, it's also the process of getting at the chase, you know, the doing the research of what is good, what is not good you know, the thrill of winning an auction or, you know, buying it online or anything like that. It's, it's actually quite fun. You know, one, one of the things I always think about these collectibles, I say, oh, I really hope, I pray that it just retains value. It doesn't have to, it could drop in value, I don't mind, but it just doesn't go from, you know, I pay a lot and it goes to worthless, right? And, or, and when I say worthless, it's not so much the monetary dollar, it's worthless that people don't care about. It's, it's one of these things, right? And that's, that's why you buy certain things. That's why you collect art. That's why you collect, you know, other collectibles, cards, because there's, there's a, a clear interest by you and other people like you around that item. And, and when there's enough interest, then, then there's, you know, there's things you can utilize for it, right? You collect and you can chat with people, you meet people, you, you know, people with similar interests. There's value in that. And uh, are you connecting with communities around these collectibles? I do. I, do. I, I mean, I've, I mean, I've connected quite a bit to the card world just because I had a um, history around collecting cards. So I knew quite a lot of people from very, very early on, even though people transition, you know, life changes. I mean, this is stuff I've been doing for 40 years, right? So it's not like, it's not like um, I'd be, you know, communicating with the same people since then. But, but there's a lot of, it's, it's a big enough community. It's global. Um, there's a lot of interest in Asia that's popped up over the last, you know, decade, I would say, uh, or, or two and a half, two decades in Japan being bigger in the early 2000s or late 90s. But um, try to try to connect to where, where, where I can. However, 
real life works also gets in the way, right? And I, and 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 the great thing about I, I would say in the world today and people of a certain age that has you know grown up in that background where we've collected, where we know what baseball cards are, where we love sports, where we then can transition from just collecting cards to other things. You start to have these people pop up in very senior corporate roles or, you know, owners of certain companies or CEOs of certain companies. And then you have common interests, which is quite unique. Uh, especially in the Asia context is rare because I, I would say, you know, away from just us and, and a few of others that we know, there's not that many people that actually own punts, for example. And when you do find people that have that interest, sometimes, you know, again, they don't talk about it. You don't know they have it. But there is interest there, and it's quite quite unique. And in Asia context, when you find that connection, it's, it's you, you try to then you know keep that connection uh, where you can, right? Of course, it's also limitation uh, if you can be in the same country. Or not, I mean, people don't realize in the U.S. it's one big country or different states, different cities, but it's very very similar. Here, we're spread around so much in different countries, different cultures, different languages, <laughs> and 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 it's not as easy accessible to to meet up um, as it is uh, in, a, in a bigger country like the US. Got it. And, and just out of curiosity as well, I mean, for this type of community, um, presumably they're not on Discord, hanging out on Discord. Like what sort of channels do you sort of connect with these guys? Is it Discord is a relatively a newer, uh, for me, I mean, it's been many years now, but, but you know, the, the common hard group, for example, was in Facebook and there were other websites that, that people um, like a Discord that people uh, congregate to. And then Instagram, I mean, again, that's show out, show your cards, and, and you connect that way, and and you know that's how you also do certain deals, right? You find people that have certain cards, and then you, um, you know, DM them right randomly, <laughs> which is kind of weird. I mean that that happens today, but but in the card world, it's not as advanced as in NFTs. I don't you kind of worry sometimes, but but in the card world, you also worry sometimes a lot of potential scams. But for the most part, if you know certain collectors and they have a long history it's somewhat reliable and, and then you try to build relationships that way sounds like um you were collecting nfts way before nfts was a thing do you want to talk to <laughs> us a little bit about i guess your your journey into crypto what, what was your sort of entry point yeah well crypto i was one of those i mean again traditional finance right there was a lot of skepticism uh, throughout even though i had friends that were in banking that you know dabbled into this i had people come to me and say hey you know, this thing called Bitcoin, why didn't you start buying some? And then one of my friends, more recent friends, and we were colleagues as well, ex-colleague as well. I think he bought one Bitcoin, like 700 bucks and, and just saw that go up. It, and it's kind of these things as, why are you investing in that? It's, it's why don't you, you know, again, more traditional, buy stocks, buy bonds, put money away and buy cards, right? I had cash and I buy cards, which is again, non-traditional in that sense. But as things progress, as times evolve, um, as people, more people could become familiar with it, at least more people that I know become more familiar with it, then I start to see the value behind cryptocurrency. I mean, it's, it's still debatable, right? How, how important it will be in the long run. But right now, you do see a utility around it that I think that is important to at least keep, keep, a, keep an eye on. So again, I dabbled into into cryptocurrencies, but not not too many years ago. I mean, I, I looked at it for many years, but I put some money to work uh, later on when I feel, felt more comfortable around the asset as well as the uh, ability for it to securely hold it. Um, and then NFTs, how that transition, I mean, as I mentioned before, transitioning from physical asset collectibles to a variety of different ways, just enjoy collecting, keeping things. NFTs became an, a natural progression for a lot of these collectors. Okay, of course, it's, you have to be of a mindset that it's not the physicalness of it has to be there, but the, the feel that it creates of an ownership of it is the more important, right? Or the chase. It's the same, th it's the same thing. I mean, it's the same feel. I, mean, I, I say that, but of course, people, different people have different interpretations of that. But when I look at it to, to look for um, an NFT, I look at the same thing, right? It's, it's, does it look good? Is it something that is relatively rare, scarce? Does it retain value in some way? Um, does it, uh, when, when I say fun, there's an element of, you know, other people around you, right? So it's a community aspect. 
is it fun to actually be part of it? And then there's, there's obviously some utility that comes out of all this. So collecting NFTs was a natural progression. I, I would say that I, the hardest part was trying to figure out how to get this stuff. And I'm not, I, I, I am somewhat technology capable to do certain things, but I was still not that advanced, right? So these are the things that also becomes hurdles for me. And, um, and so I didn't jump in right away. But the NFT, well, one of the first, we wouldn't say the first, but I always remember mm-hmm. this as, as the first. It's, 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 a, it's a beautiful explanation of how you transition from physical to uh, digital was uh, in late, 19, uh, late 2019, early 2020, Panini came out with these cards called um, Panini Blockchain Cards. And what it was, was they had 100 cards set that was returned, I think, each week. And it came with a digital twin. Well, effectively, they were selling the digital twin and you get a free physical twin. <laughs> okay. And, and this is 20, early 2020, right? When it, when it first came out. And um, they, they, you know, they set up a, a closed uh, blockchain, closed blockchain, which, which made sense for the collect. It's kind of just getting people to be um, aware of this. And this is around the same time, you know, Top Shot kind of came out. This is a physical card, just a card, but a digital image that people can right-click save effectively, right? But you actually have ownership of it in Panini's own closed network. And then you get the physical card. So I said, this is pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's cool in the sense that it's unique. And, and I can see why uh, an ownership set up like that may be interesting from a digital perspective. So I, I, I chased one card. It was when the second or third week of release. Uh, I went for a John Moran page, quite a lot for it, but I, I wanted a card, a local man card, which is a local man, National Treasures, which is Panini um, kind of flagship, but it wasn't, it was a Panini uh, National Treasures blockchain. So it was a kind of an additional stamp, but it was done as a Dutch auction where it, you know, set one week, it was set, start the auction price. I think it's, a, I believe it's a hundred thousand and then it went down every, every few minutes. And then I, I jumped in and then got that. And then I've got a few more and then, and then I get a, I met, some great people in that, that community, both originally from the beginning as well as later on, and then start collecting those NFTs because again, it was a very similar thing that I can I can see and feel, right? And I understood, and that's why then it opened up to other things. You know, is there a lot of crossover? Do you think, you know, with more traditional card makers transitioning into NFTs because it just feels like a the next logical step, right? I, it, you know, I, I say that of course, but but also. You have to remember the demographics of card collectors, the more traditional that's been here for a long time, much older, older group. And, and that's really because the big boom in cards, at least in the, in the more, in the last, you know, five, six decades, the big boom in cards was the late 80s, early 90s, right? When we had a, another bull market at that time, oversupply, overproduction, and, you know, then cards became worse. You know, I remember 1987 talks, is a, Jose Canseco, Mark McGuire, all these guys that, Everybody chased, but it became not really valuable anymore. They produced so much, but it's the people that grew up during that time that are now in the you know in the forties, uh, some in the fifties. The boomers. That uh, yeah, it's it's and I'm one of them, right? So, so it's, <laughs> it's it's then trying to understand the elements of having a digital, you know, putting value uh, on a digital asset, which I, I can understand why it's harder to to grasp that. And then you, you throw on the element of trying to keep it secure in a MetaMask wallet, in a wallet, for example. I can imagine how difficult that is for a lot of people. So then they push it away. They, they like what they like. Yeah, I guess the sports memorabilia, it's a little bit different in the sense that, you know, when it comes to provenance of jerseys, you know, game-worn jerseys and signatures from the actual player, I mean, you can't really replicate that digitally, right? I mean, that's just that's just a real physical, tangible piece that you can sort of, um, you know, uh, validate. So, which is a nice sort of touch to, to, to cards, I guess. That's sort of cool. And then to, what was your first NFT? Was that the, for, technically your first NFT, the Panini digital card? It, it probably had something, something else smaller before, but I couldn't really remember. It was, you know, I chased, um, you know, garbage pile kids and under when they traded in wax uh, before and a few others, but, but that was really the first one that, that stood out. I remember, uh, that, for me, it reminds me of, again, that transition and it helped me transition. Like really, I understood it. You know, I understood what it meant. Got it. And that was in 2020. So that was relatively early-ish in the NFT game. Yeah. And then and you had all these guys, you know, you had all these other guys in, in late 2020, 
2020, 2021, right? When they jumped into punks, jumped into, and then, you know, getting bored. Uh, that was kind of a later, later bunch. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to us a little bit about your journey into crypto punks. Like, how did you hear about them and, you know, what led you to ultimately buying your punk? Well, I had a, a board eight before, um, and I kind of understood, but I, I did it as, you know, I, again, it's one of these things where there's an element of curiosity. You, there was a somewhat kind of trying to find out a little more, but yeah, you get to, to spend money. And I felt that from a, uh, understanding, looking at the, the opportunity, it was, it was a good way to jump in. So I jumped into that and I felt that the community was very strong at the time, especially in the beginning. And then, um, an opportunity came up to, and I looked at punks throughout. I mean, punks I knew uh, since, as I said uh, earlier on. It's just that when I looked at the punks itself, I mean, the weird, it's kind of a weird thing, right? I, I look at, it's kind of like, I had to find a punk that looked like me. <laughs> and that element of it is like, hmm, it, it made me be too picky and choosy throughout. It, it was kind of, it didn't have to be like me, but it was kind of like, I have to be something that reflects me. Because it's a human, right? It's, a, it's a, actually a, a digital face, a head. So you want to have something that's more familiar or similar to yourself. And that really kept me from picking one. It's, it's kind of weird. It's just, it's just like, I look at, I mean, how many of thousands of time uh, of different ones and, and thousands of times those ones say, hey, this, what do you think about this? I mean, I, I, I spend, and that's a, the collector in me, right? I, I would look at this all the time. I go to the, the, the web, uh, CryptoPunk website and just scroll through what's available, what's sold, what are the trades. I mean, I probably spend so much time on this type of stuff. And it was easier to go to board eight just because it's an eight, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't really, you didn't really have to pick, I mean, there's some traits, but it didn't really have to be you. And then later on, I, I, I had the board ape and I found, you know, it, this whole thing back to the collector mentality. It's, you have to find what's original to the space, what's important to the space. Um, and I think crypto punk fit that bill. And then once I said, okay, well, I'll look at it from a, from a collector mindset, uh, it made it ticked all the boxes. Um, as I mentioned, you know what I look at, what what I look for, and then I start finding other people with similar interests that made it so that you know I realize what's the value behind it. I mean, I, I, I you know, these are built collectively in the community, um, and so I, I then jumped into one, and it, it was only a year ago. But I've looked at this a couple of years, <laughs> but only about a year ago I bought my punk. Yeah, nice. Yeah, it's it's a really nice punk you've got too, and it, it does look like you. It's got the rosy cheeks and the uh, and the narrow face. But um, so it's a it's a blue bandana, rosy cheeks, and regular shades. You know, wh- why were you sort of looking at these traits, and were you looking at any other traits that you sort of felt anything towards? Well, funny enough, the the blue bandana was the first thing I, I chose. And no matter, so I was gonna, if I was gonna get one, I'm gonna get a blue bandana anyways because I I get Kentucky blue and all that stuff, and I like the color blue, and it kind of fit. The whole thing, the whole theme, the the shades was just. I thought it was cool to get shades because uh, if you can, it didn't necessarily have to be shades, but shades is, is also just looks cool and it's it's a trait that I think makes the profile pic stand out a bit. It makes it look cool. And then the then I, I started looking at what what's available at the time, and the rosy cheeks made it rarer, right? Made it there's an element of rareness, and and it's you know it it looked different and. There's some history around this particular punk, so I, I, I then I, I decided to, to take that. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't the cheapest. It was actually quite expensive at the time. It wasn't I mean, above floor because I, I, when when I jumped in, I remember the floor dropped quite a lot. But I was going to stick to a blue bandana with certain traits I like. I didn't really care, and I didn't. And I, I almost bought one other that somebody else bought, and I, I, I put it in a bid. Yeah, it's a little bit, but then when I started put it in the bid, someone jumped in and bought it right away. So I said, okay, screw that. Just, Pick one I like and just buy it. <laughs> nice. I just had a look at the um, transaction history. Do you know that uh, it was originally claimed by Hemba? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's a Hemba punk. He's, uh, I guess every, you're bound to get uh, one of his every single time. Yeah. No, that's cool, man. It's it's a really, really cool punk for sure. And uh, I noticed you, you got your wife into a, a punk uh, as well. She, uh, she's she got a, a beautiful punk yes, recently. Yes. Yeah, she it was like, well, she's she's also looked at for some time, but she had a she had a board eight. Um, but no, no, I thought it was a good time to transition as well. I mean, this is again a, a collector, and and for her, it's also you know looking at something that's unique, different, right? She has other, uh, we, we won't go into too much detail, but other aspirations of this and personal life. Um, and that prompt was 
I thought like, uh, you know, quite unique and something that, you know, she would enjoy owning. So we jumped into it just very recently, last week, I think. Yeah, it's a beautiful punk. Pink with hat, um, pretty, pretty rare and noticeable too. So uh, congratulations on, on that, uh, best if you're listening. And if money wasn't an issue, like what would be your dream punk, do you think? Oh, I mean, if, if money was an issue, I think Deepak has a, the dream punk already, right? Which is the, <laughs> the alien blue bandana. Yeah. That would, uh, that's a bit of, un, that's a bit of uh, money that you have to fork up for something like that. But, but again, that would be the one. A, a lazy, a lazy 20 million just lying around. Be, uh, made it, and uh, I also noticed that you managed to get the Tiffany's pendant with your punk. How, how was that whole experience for you? Oh, great. I mean, I, in the beginning, it was, again, it, it went back to, you know, there's this, what, what is this? You know, like it, and, and you spend some time doing research on it. You start to try to understand how this is relevant culturally uh, for the, the NFT world, the physical world, how Tiffany plays an element of, you know, documenting this, right? Giving it uh, a, a, a certain value that I think only certain brands can, can provide. And when that kind of came all together into uh, a pendant, I mean, there's something that you want. It's a one-on-one, something that's yours. And as I said, I like my punk a lot, right? So uh, I took time um, and effort to, to acquire it. And having a physical made, which is documented, which is a one-on-one, uh, which looks great, uh, is something that I, uh, I definitely had to get. And then, you know, I, I wear it once in a while. Which is cool too, right? I mean, it's not like I, it's just a, like, like my watches and all that. Um, it, you know, it'll scratch up, it'll uh, eventually be worn down. At some point in time, will I ever sell it? I mean, I don't, I don't envision it, but if it, if it, if it ever happens, I mean, again, that would be the, the imprint that I put on the physical punk of mine. Nice. Has anybody in Singapore asked you what it is? <laughs> no, only the people at Tiff, well, the people in Tiffany know what it is, but they were like, is it, obviously when they, I think there was in in three or four people that took delivery in Singapore. So, so um, I was the I believe I was the first when I picked it up because it just arrived and first or second. But they said that you know different different boutiques had different um, people decided to pick a, a different boutique. Um, but it was you know a great time to just chat and kind of explain what it is. <laughs> yeah, I, I I went to um, pick up uh, King's. Tiffany pendant with him here in Hong Kong. I think his was the only one. Nobody had any idea what it was. And, uh, and, and we, we got there expecting champagne because like, we saw you tweeting, like you were, you were popping bottles of champagne at Tiff- Tiffany's and uh, King and I didn't get anything. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> but um, no, it's uh, that's a beautiful, beautiful punk you have. And uh, congratulations on, on that. And Thank you. Uh, to you and Bess as well on her, on her punk. Um, and what, what about now? Like, are you are you looking at any collections? You're looking at eyeing anything off in this market, or um, you just sort of sitting tight? Yeah, I mean, look, I I, I wouldn't mind buying more pops. I mean, it's just I have to find the ones I like. I mean, I, again, as you know, I, I look at a lot at times. Free time, I, I I tend to look. I, I I do believe in the in the future, you know, value of of this of of crypto pops, uh, the relevance of it all. When we look in the history books, you know, thirty, forty, fifty years. Uh, from now, they will come up. So from that as- aspect of it, I think having more than less is good. But of course, it's a, it's a, it's, as I said, it's, a, it's also important in terms of how people value it. And then, and then what is the entry price that makes sense? You can't, you have other real life needs, right? So don't go, you know, borrowing money to buy these things. It doesn't make sense. It's, it's a, and that's, that's, that's the real collector mindset. You should never, you should buy what you like. Um, so that's that's one thing you have to balance that, and everything is so expensive these days. I mean, of course, the prices have come out a lot, but but prices is all relative, right? So make sure you have a, your finances in order, and that these are like you have excess uh, capacity to do it, and you find the ones you like, get it at a good price, then you just grab it. And for me, I I wouldn't mind picking up a handful more. Yep. So for the, all the listeners, uh, make sure you pick up the blue bandanas before Art does. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I don't mind diversifying, obviously, and do the other ones. Don't have to be blue bandanas. Oh, man. And if you had to look across, I guess, the, the punk community at the moment, do you have any favorite punks that come to mind? Well, I like, I mean, again, every punk that I, I connect with, I, I really uh, appreciate all of them. I think for, for what they do to build the community. I don't think it's harder to 
pinpoint to one. I mean, there's, there's this guy called Punk9527. Um, you ever heard of him? <laughs> no, it's just, uh, I've never heard of him at all. <laughs> yes. no, but, but, you know, it's guys like you, right? That, you know, put a lot of us together, you know, help find ways to, to connect uh, all of us and, and build a stronger community and build a, a, a cooler club or, or group, which provides a lot of, uh, I think, utility to, to a lot of us. And, and, you know, linking that back to what I said around the collectible cards world or other collectible worlds, it's a community that makes, that makes an impression on, on you, uh, on that, what you do around that. So I think, you know, someone like you who, you know, prepares and puts together these punk cats, and I know it's not easy to, to do, I know almost 60 odd that you've already done, but, but, you know, thank you for, for doing that. You know, I think that that's how, that's how value is created. Oh, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, no, 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 I think most people just sort of joke around half the time, but that sounds sort of sounds semi semi genuine. So I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> Everything I say is genuine. I'm a bank. <laughs> <laughs> um, and how how would you describe punk culture for you? Oh, uh, punk culture is unique. I, I, it's hard to to find the right words. I mean, there's an element of uniqueness, authentic, authenticness, um, uh, creative. In the in the in the you know to be early, I, I don't know the the right the right term, but there's that feeling. You know, there's this element of being early, being authentic, doing what you want, doing what you think can can be of value to not only you but the rest of the group uh, and other people. And, and and there's an element of that, and that's the feeling I, I, I get when I look at the punk and I communicate and connect with other uh, uh, punks in the community. So the, it's a it's a unique group, and it provides a lot of uh, energy uh, that that comes to me when I when I and, and that's and that's probably one of the reasons why I start I, I continue to look deep deeper dig deeper into into this just because there's there's a level of energy and support that comes out of it. No, I, th- I think I think uh, most people sort of get the gist of what you're what you're sort of describing, uh, almost like pioneers in some senses, right? Um, you know, yeah, being yeah, early that's a good and, <laughs> and uh, trying to drive them through. So. Um, so some some other side questions now, just on the punks in general. How do you feel about V one punks? I mean, uh, V one punks. You know, as I, I I don't know the the intricacies around the history as much. I, I know the background of why they are also important. Why they do have a, a place in history. And and again, from a pure collector as a collectible, I would say that I don't mind. I mean, I think it's something that people would chase. You know, people would try to get. Certain, especially you know, if you try to get the the ones of your punk or you know, things or punks that you think are worth collecting, worth acquiring, but the community may be different. I mean, again, as I said, it's it's, it's a community aspect, and maybe that one I, because I don't know, I'm not in, I'm not in a, that community may be as strong as well, but you you don't see it as much. You don't see uh, people uh, coming together like they do for you know, the crypto punks itself. Um, so so from that aspect of it, I can see why crypto punks versus V1 punks, and I'm just categorizing it that way, uh, will be different. Yeah. yeah. That's cool. And, um, and, and you coming from being a board ape originally to, you know, using a, a profile picture as your punk, how did you feel about the Yuga acquisition of punks? It's okay. I mean, like from a business standpoint, again, putting on my banker hat made sense for them, for Yuga to do it. Don't know what the price or value they they, they placed on it, um, but from a business sense, I can see the the elements of why they should do it, and there's a there's a real logic behind it. From a, a group perspective, as I said, it doesn't necessarily have to mean that they influence the community aspect of it, and that's one thing why I like pots, right? Because we kind of create our own community, we kind of create our own uh, way of doing things, and it's it's the people underneath. It's not the asset per se, right? It's the value that we place on the asset. So I, I think that's, that's one way to think about it. So whoever owns it, not necessarily, unless they you know, decide to like change the whole thing, right? I mean, like do, I mean, again, utilize the branding in a certain way, but as long as they let it get free, I think that that's the best, that's the best outcome we could have never had. Gotcha. No, it makes sense. And um, maybe uh, another question, just, you know, leveraging your, um, skill set and expertise uh in the, the space at the moment what's what's next for crypto in your view where do we go from here 
<laughs> not financial advice. I, <laughs> I mean, but caveat that, but I don't know. I mean, I think there'll be a lot of ups and downs, of course, but it's, it's the long-term relevance. And I think, I think I, I still believe in it. I still believe that there is clear, what's the right word, utility or value to it in the long run. I don't know about the short-term price swings, but that's the nature of, you know, newer asset classes anyways, that there'll be a lot of ups and downs, a lot of price discovery, a lot of use case discoveries that will take place. But I think that if you can weather or stomach the volatility in the long run, there will be a, a better outcome or a better use case for it. Um, and, and thus, the, the value of it should be, should be more. I mean, that's, that's, the natural, that's the natural evolution. But in the short term, it could be, you know, it could be at 100, it could be at 10, it's somewhere in between. It's going to be a rocky ride. <laughs> do, do you think we'll get through this uh, regulatory FUD? Uh, of course. I mean, I think that's the short-term thing. And, and, and FUD is FUD. I mean, I mean there's, there's, there's obviously a uh, purpose and intention of why, they, uh, why regulators would do things. And sometimes it's beyond us to really comprehend because they have other focuses they need to, to uh, cater to, right? So I, I, I would believe that it would get over it, but at, at how long and, and at what time, don't know. That's something that could go on for a long time. Yeah, gotcha. All right. Well, what, one one other question before we sort of close off. If you could pass on a message to the next owner of your punk, 7298, what would you like to say to them? Say, um, enjoy it. I mean, hopefully you have a better use for it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's something that you, you wanted to collect, but hopefully I don't have to say any of this stuff. I, mean, <laughs> I, just, I, just, I would just keep it. <laughs> for me, it's, it's, it's hard to let things go. I mean, things I've, I've held, I, I tend to, to do that. So I don't really think about that. Um, but if, if it ever does have to go, then I just hope, hopefully they, they find a good use for it and it goes well in their collection. Yeah, nice. Art, um, mate, thank you so much for uh, your time, man. Like, I um, know you're a super busy man Welcome. and uh, you're sorely missed by the uh, Hong Kong DGENs. So you'll have to come back one day and, uh, uh, and join us. But um, but yeah, thank you so much, man. And uh, this was an absolute blast unpacking your story and your punk story. Any final yeah. closing comments and, uh, you know, where can people find you? Yeah, uh, th- thanks very much. I mean, I, I actually enjoy this. It's probably one of my first podcasts or uh, talks that I've ever, I've ever done. So, again, it's, it's been a lot of fun uh, to do this with you. You can find me on my, probably Twitter is probably the, the best place. So, at uh, artkaru9. I mean, there's history around the nine as well, right? So, you guys... That uh, that I'll explain at another point in time, <laughs> but, but there is a reason why it's AK nine. <laughs> you, you you can't leave us hanging. Yeah, um, why the nine? <laughs> That's for episode two, man. Don't you know? <laughs> <laughs> no, the, okay, just just the, the nine. My basketball jersey number, and 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 though you know that's why AK nine was just the easiest. I was at my football number was twenty seven. But then again, that was a uh, that could have been the case as well. But nine was something that uh, has relevance to me. Yeah. Uh, nice, beautiful, beautiful way to end it. Thanks again, Art. And uh, yeah, hopefully we can catch up soon, man. Uh, either in Singapore or in Hong Kong. But um, do 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 definitely hit me up. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And guys, that uh, wraps up another episode of Punkcast for the week. And uh, we'll be back next week with another awesome punk. Bye for now. <laughs>